Thank, thank you, Cindy. Uh, good evening, everyone. It's an honor to be here and have a chance to chat with you tonight. Let's uh, imagine that you're standing in the mountains of Panama right now, tonight, April 6th, and it's your first day in the tropics. You just arrived late this afternoon, and immediately you went out to see what the montane forests look like. It's 6 p.m. now. You're still a mile and a half from the lodge. Waves of mist are coming up the valley. Bromeliads drape the trees. Ferns and mosses are everywhere. It's getting dark. This is the tropics. And you need to get back. You know there's jaguars, pumas, poisonous snakes here. But you can't move. You can't move. You're mesmerized by the birds. They're singing all around you. You can't see any of them, but you can hear them. You suddenly realize that flute-like call that's just been going on, that one right there, that's a black, black faced solitaire. That's a close relative to our Townsend solitaire here in the Pacific Northwest. You don't see it, but you can hear. It sounds like a full woodwind quartet singing there. Now we have a single voice box, but birds have two of them. They have two syrinxes. And this bird is using both of them at the same time. It's harmonizing with itself. Just listen closely. Each of its songs are a little different. Yes, spectacular flute-like call. Suddenly a gray-breasted woodwind starts to sing down over the hill and you turn to stare in that direction. This family has its biggest radiation of species here in the Neotropics. We've got several species in western Washington. It's an outstanding bird. And one of them, one species, gets over into Europe, and they have the audacity to call it the wren. Suddenly realize, this is actually a duet going on. There's both members of the pair are singing at the same time. They're alternating notes back and forth in order to stay together. It's just amazing. There's howler monkeys in the background. Then the raucous call of a free wattle bellbird causes you to almost jump out of your skin. You'd hope this bird might be back from the Caribbean side. This is a Katinga. It's in a group of birds that are known as the Subossines, for lack of a better word. There's a whole separate group within the Pershing birds that have their major radiation in Latin America, and this is one of those. And you, you're hoping that you'll get to see one, but now you've heard it. You can then hear it, a familiar sound. But you think, that's a sound from the Pacific Northwest. But I'm in the tropics right now. You listen to it a little bit more. Yes, you're right, that is a Swenson thrush. It's here, it's on its migration north from spending the winter down in uh, northern South America, headed back up. Maybe this bird will be in our backyard in another six weeks and we'll get to hear it there. Just a wonderful flute-like call. And you hear that oop, oop, oop down over the hill. That's a Highlands Titamu. That's one of the, the Titamu groups of birds, which they sort of look like chickens, but they're not at all related to chickens. They're actually related to ostriches and emus and rat tides. They're one in that rat tide group. Um, and you hadn't even realized you'd get to hear one of those here. So we listened to a lot of birds and hopefully got you into this setting now. And what we want to explore tonight is why do we have the bird community that we have in any given location? Whether that's the cloud forest of Panama or whether it's the temperate rainforest here in western Washington. And how might those two areas be linked in helping us understand these bird communities? But first, I need to get you to Panama and get you down there to this forest that we've been enjoying here. So Panama is the connection between North and South America it's the isthmus, the narrow band of land. It runs east-west, not north-south, and connects North America up to the left through Costa Rica and South America down through Colombia to the right. And if you look at this elevational map, it'll give you a good sense for that. Coming down from the left are the mountains of Central America. They're actually an extension of the Rocky Mountains coming all the way down and into 
to Panama, and then off to the right is the mountains that head down into Colombia and connect into the Andes. And if you notice, right in the middle there where that, that little lake is, that's where they put the Panama Canal through. It's relatively low, so they didn't have to raise ships up very high. That's the isthmus. The isthmus is relatively young. It started to form about 15 million years ago, and it only closed about two and a half million years ago, actually connecting the two continents, North and South America. We're going to come back to that point several times as we go through the talk. Now, we're in western part of Panama, and you see Mount Barrow there with the line down there. That's the highest peak in Panama. It is an active volcano. And we're just immediately to the left, to the west of that, at Mount Tatumas, in the mountains there. And if you look at this relief map, it gives you a little better feeling for that elevation there. Everything that's in white or gray here is 1,500 meters or above, so about 6,500 feet or above. The lodge is sitting right there at that 6,500 foot level. The red line is the Costa Rican border between Panama and Costa Rica. And if you see the big kind of circle white just to the right of the middle there, that's Mount Barrow. In between it, Barrow, in between it and that kind of point of red is where Mount Tatumas. Now, if you're a little short of breath right now, that's because we're at 6,500 feet, which is about like the elevation of, of Paradise at Mount Rainier or Sunrise at Mount Rainier. So we're moderately high elevation. Now the next morning, you get up early. You want to go look for birds. Breakfast is early at the lodge. You grab yourself a cup of coffee, shade grown coffee, of course, and you walk out onto the deck. Well, forget about drink, having your breakfast. You're just going to have coffee because the birds are there already and you got to kind of concentrate on them. Here's a female flame-colored tanager that's coming in to feed on some fruit. They eat the fruit, digest the outer part, pass the seed through their digestive system, unhurt, and they're a major seed disperser. Here's the male, flame-colored tanager, close relative of our western tanager. Clay-colored thrush, look at the shape of that. Looks almost exactly like an American robin, right? Well, it's in that genus. Here's a uh, rufous-colored sparrow, close relative of our white-crowned sparrow and golden-crowned sparrow. Common Chlorospingus used to be known as the common bush tanager, but they changed it to its genus name, Chlorospingus, because it's not actually a tanager. Talamanca hummingbird, a close relative of our Rivoli's hummingbird in the southwest. A snowy-bellied hummingbird. Cute little thing. And a silver-throated tanager. This one's trying to build a nest in among these bromeliads, but that stick is a little too long, can't figure out how to get it into the hole, so I thought it might use the ramming approach, but that didn't work either. You turn around and look up, and there's a swallowtail kite. You watch this thing for a good five minutes, it never once flaps its wings, just using a little bit of currents coming up there to fly spectacularly. In another two months, it might be in Florida breeding. That was a clay-colored thrush. Now there's the thick-billed euphonia. This is the male. Oh, here's a flycatcher. This is one of the Alanias. Now, there are three species of Alanias there. Mountain Alania, Lesser Alania, and yellow belly. They are hard to tell apart. Sounds like our flycatchers up here, right? Tropical kingbird. He's staring us down. Slady flower piercer. Now, these are pollen pirates. They go in from the side. This is the female. They go in from the side, poke a hole in there, and get out the nectar. So they don't actually carry pollen between flowers the way a pollinator might. This is the male. He does have a tail. It will come back in a second. There's his tails back again. Very energetic little birds. So female, thick-billed euphonia. One of the really big flycatchers, this is a boat bill flycatcher, very raucous, often makes a lot of noise, and a blue-gray tanager. Now what did we just see in all these birds? Mostly what we saw was perching birds, birds in the, the family passeriforms. Some of them were permanent residents, some were migrants. Some look much like the birds we have in Washington, but have a different set of feathers on there. 
Now, passeriforms, that order, that's one of the orders of birds. It's, uh, there's 41 orders of birds in the current classification, and an order is that level just below the class level in a classification system. So the class is birds, and then below that are a set of orders. We've got 41 of them, and like all the ducks and geese are in one order. Um, you know, the shorebirds and, and uh, terns and gulls are all in another order. So you have sets of orders like that. Passerines or perching birds is the largest order and has about half the species of birds of the world. And these are some that we just saw. So on the left side, the four on the left are four songbirds in the suborder songbirds. So the silver-throated tanager, clay-colored thrush, slaty flower piercer, and, and a sparrow. So that's in the songbird group. The other group is known as the subossines, and I don't know another name for that group. It includes the flycatchers. These are both flycatchers. Also includes the contingas. In Latin America, you get things like ant shrikes and ant birds and uh, the wood creepers that run up and down, sort of like what our brown creeper does. And, you know, there's a, a whole set of birds that are in this group. Now, the songbirds and the subossines both are large radiations, but the subossines has its biggest radiation in Latin America. This kind of shows you that, that setup. So we've got the order passerines, then under that there's three suborders. There's a small group, the New Zealand wrens, which are only found on New Zealand, only two living species. And then there's this big group of about a thousand that are subossines. There's a few subossines in Australia, a few in Asia, and a few in Africa, but most of them are South America. And then there's the songbirds, which have about 4,000 of them. That's everything that we see, most of what we see locally here in the songbird category, the sparrows, the finches, the chickadees, the nuthatches, the thrushes, those are all songbirds. Well, I want to go back a little bit. Let's go back to 94 million years ago and talk a little bit about the process of science and how our society develops new theories, tests those theories, collects more d data, and debates them. And so 94 million years ago, we were in the middle of the Cretaceous. The dinosaurs dominated the landscape. Now we jump to the 1970s when I was a graduate in graduate school working on my PhD in ornithology. At that time, in the 70s, someone put out a novel theory. They looked at a set of dinosaurs and they looked at birds and they looked at their skeletal structures of that and they said, wow, these skeletons look fairly similar. Maybe birds are descendant from dinosaurs. Oh my word, was that controversial. It just created this buzz in the scientific literature with factions coming in on both sides of it and arguing for and against it and back and forth. So, you know, at the time, my friends and I, all in graduate school, were getting ready our comprehensive exams, which you have five professors come in and they can ask you any question they want in the, in the world. And so we didn't really know where some of them stood on this theory. So we had to make sure we understood both sides of it inside and out so we could answer that question and argue back and forth. Now it's a given. The recent genetics, a whole lot more fossils. All of it support the concept that birds are dinosaurs. They are descendant of dinosaurs. And they need to go back and renew do Jurassic Park because those velociraptors should have feathers on them. And every time I see them running across the screen, I yell at that screen, they should have feathers on them. Well, anyways, I also in graduate school took a botany class and I was trying to get broader knowledge than just about birds. And the author that wrote the text for the botany class was totally opposed to continental drift. And he used every example that he could come up with around botany examples to try to refute continental drift. Well, he was wrong. Continental drift is real. And this is where the continents were in the middle of the Cretaceous. Now, at the end of the Cretaceous, about 64 million years ago, we had a giant meteor that crashed into the Gulf of Mexico and killed the dinosaurs. Now, at the time, you look down to the south there, Australia and Antarctica connected. There's actually a connection to South America at that time. An animal or a bird could walk between those three continents at the end of the Cretaceous. That's important because the, the ancestors of birds had to survive someplace. And, you know, 10 years ago, 
people were arguing that looked like all the orders of birds may actually existed at the time of the Cretaceous. Now they say, nope, that's not right with more genetic analysis. Some of them did, but you know, how many of them we don't know and how many evolved later. But it's pretty clear the ancestors to the passerines, to the perching birds, survived in these southern continents, somewhere in Australia or Antarctica. And then over these next several million years, they're going to get um, divided and continue to evolve. Now, the songbirds hadn't evolved yet, but the passerine group had. And so when we get to the Eocene, we're starting to get some additional separation of the continents. Notice we still have the gap between North and South America. That's important. We still have a connection between Australia, Antarctica, and South America. Antarctica is not frozen. It is starting to freeze. It's got a polarized cap, but it still has vegetation and land across it. And at that point, at the end of the Eocene, the songbirds, that group, is starting to evolve in Australia. But the sub are already spread around these southern continents, and there's sub in South America at that point. And we get to the Miocene, you now have a good separation between South America and Antarctica, a good separation between Australia and Antarctica, and we now have the Southern Oceans. Well, if you've ever read about or have been lucky enough to try to go to Antarctica and you left from South America, you've got to go across the Drake's Passage. And what's it known for? It's known for huge winds and massive currents running through there. So we have you know, the roaring 40s, the screaming... 60s. Those are the terms that are used for that current that go there. Well, once that current formed, Antarctica froze up solid. We've got total isolation between Australia and South America. We've got the songbirds in Australia. We've got, and they're starting to evolve into species. And we've got the sub in South America without songbirds to bother them so they can evolve into lots of species. The songbirds spread out from there, from Australia, actually come all the way over into North America. We get groups of them that evolve totally into new families in North America, like the wrens that I mentioned earlier. And we're going to come back to some of that kinds of issues some more. So we're getting this change going on. Now, we need to get back out and see some birds. So we're here at Mount Tatumas. Mount Tatumas is at 8 degrees north latitude. Day length varies little through the year. Sunlight varies little. Temperature here at 6,500 feet. You know, in the night it gets down into the mid-60s. In the day it gets up into the 70s. And that's about how it all varies. But what does vary is rainfall. They have a wet season and a dry season. From November into April, beginning of May, is the dry season. And April is this transition. So in from December into April, the Caribbean is dominating the weather pattern. This is early morning, taking shot from the lodge, looking east up over the Continental Divide. You can see some clouds trying to come up over the Continental Divide. You know, if it looks like this, if the Caribbean is going to win the day, we're going to have a sunny day today to go out looking for birds. From May into the late fall, the, uh, the Pacific is the dominant force and it's the rainy season on this Pacific side at Mount Tatumas. If you get up or out in the middle of the day and you look down and the fog is starting to come up the valley, the Pacific is winning the fight that day. You may have rain, you may have five or ten minutes of rain, you may only have fog, you may have an hour and a half or two hours of rain in April, but you know that's the, that's the Pacific. So April is a dynamic time to be there and it's one of the reasons why I wanted to go was because with those rains, you also started to get the breeding season for birds. Now we can understand that a little bit more looking at the topography. So this is a line drawn from the Pacific Ocean up through Mount Tatumas, up over the continental divide and down into the Caribbean. And Mount Tatumas is at that 6,300, 6,400 feet. That's where the lodge is. And so during the dry season, the Caribbean is dominated and rains are being pushed in from the Caribbean. They rise up over the mountains. The rain falls on that side. When it comes down on this side, it's drier. When the Pacific winds, it's coming up from the Pacific side. The rain falls on the west side, on the Pacific side, and we get the rainy season. So with the rains, we get flowers. And with the flowers, we get fruits. This is a relative of an avocado. It's a member of that family of birds. It's high in nutrients, 
both proteins and fats, really sought after by birds and mammals. And there are two species that I really wanted to see, so I timed my visit for April and hoped that they would be back. They are known as altitudinal migrants. They migrate, but they migrate up and down the mountains. And both these species in the dry season at Mount Tatumas go over to the Caribbean side down to the lowlands. And with the starts of the rains, they come back over to the Pacific side in order to get ready to nest. And one of them is the resplendent cassell. It's an altitudinal migrant coming from the Caribbean side where it was for the fall to sit here and maybe breathe. This is a pair of cassells that are courting in the background, if you can hear it. This is the nest cavity. See the tail sticking out? So in April, they pair up. They may start nesting or they may not. They may get silent and not nest until May, depending upon food availability and rain. Um, but, you know, they're just really timing that to the fruit. Get a load of that tail and that tail waves back and forth in the, in the wind. Um, just a magnificent bird. We also have other birds that respond to the fruit. Collar trogon, that was a male. Collar trogon, this is the female. But a big draw was these quetzals. They're a legend within both the Maya and Aztec civilization. And I never got tired of seeing them or hearing them. Now, trogons have an interesting distribution. This is the distribution of the family. There's 35 living species. They're found in South America, Australia, and the uh, Southern Asia, but not in, not in Australia. They're found in Africa and Southern Asia, but not Australia. And there's lots of science that suggests their evolution might have taken place in Europe. But then how did they get to South America? Just an interesting question. Um, you know, did they come across through North America and down? Or did they come across when the continents were closer together, just across the Atlantic? Good question. So if you're looking for a project, there's a project to be figured out. There are other fruit eaters, emerald toucanets. These guys also are big seed dispersers, the northern emerald toucanet. So altitudinal migrants. Now, can you name some altitudinal migrants? Oh, I forgot this bird first. Yes. So the other one I wanted to see was the three waddle bellbird. Now, this is a Katinga. So it's one of the Katinga families. That's the, another group of Sabacines. And they're interesting. They come over the mountains from the Caribbean side. And then they set up what's known as a dispersed lek. So the males will set up a territory. And then maybe a couple hundred yards, quarter mile away, another male will set up the territory. And they use a band of forest that runs right through where Mount Tatumas Lodge is. It's right there at that... 63 to 6,900 feet elevation, and for some reason, that's where the males come, and they set up territories, and the male will display with that obnoxiously loud call from either top of a set of perches like this, or they have a few perches down in the canopy too, and they just call there all day. And they hope a female will come in and check them out, and if she likes them, then she might mate with them, but then she goes off and raises the young on their own. So this is the three-waddled bellbird. Look at how wide it opens its mouth. And I've seen videos of these. They will open their mouth, and it's like a second later before that loud screech comes out. Now, can you name some altitude migrants here in Washington? Um, the dark eye junco is a good one. It's here in Seattle all year round, but you have a lot more in the winter because they'll go back up into the mountains. Some of them will in the summer. The... Um, Ruby crown kinglet, the varied thrush, and the hermit thrushes are all birds here that go up and down the mountains with the seasons. So we do have altitudinal migrants here. Now I want to spend a little bit of time with this genus. This is American robin. It does occur in Panama, but you probably all, all know this bird. And this genus is really fascinating. There's more than 80 species in this genus. And you know, if you look at this bird, you'd say immediately looking at that, oh, that's an American robin. But look at it as we get out of a silhouette. Almost the exact same body shape to American robin. But this is a clay-colored thrush. Now, calling in the background is a white-throated thrush, another member in this genus. 
The genus is thought to have originated in Eurasia sometime 10 or so million years ago. And then it's spread across the, the, the world. It's not in Australia, but it is very abundant in Europe and Asia and Africa. And uh, it's made it over into North America, into the New World, Western Hemisphere, somewhere around 4 to 12 million years ago. Some authors think it came across to North America. Others think it came across into the Antilles area, kind of northern part of South America. Then it spread out. All the genetics suggest it was just one set of birds that made it across, one species, and from that we have more than 40 species of turtles in the Western Hemisphere. Now here we've got the American robin on the left. It doesn't get down into the to Panama. And then the four species that are at Mount Tatumas are on the right. So we have the clay-colored thrush, which has a wide distribution. The mountain thrush, which is a little narrower in distribution, a little higher in elevation. The white-throated thrush and the sooty thrush. Now the sooty thrush is a high elevation species. The other three are right around the lodge. I could easily find clay-colored thrushes. Mountain thrushes were pretty easy to find. I heard and got nice sound recordings of white-throated thrushes, but I had a heck of a time ever seeing one. So it's just the little differences in their behavior. So the whole family that has the thrushes is a much bigger family. It has over 170 species. Here in North America, you think of other thrushes. It includes the solitaires. It includes the American robin. It includes bluebirds. Um, it includes things like a hermit thrush and Swainson's thrush. But I want to spend a little time looking at one particular genus, Catharis. That's Greek for pure or clean. It's a Western Hemisphere genus. There's just 12 living species. Now, if you looked at this map, you might instantly say, I know what that bird is. Oh, I've got the name up there in the picture. That's a Swainson's thrush. Well, Swainson's thrush is in this genus, Catharis. And it breeds here in Washington and then across through the boreal forest. And there's actually two subspecies. There's the rusted back, which is what we have up here in Washington, goes up through the boreal forest. Then there's the olive back that nests in riparian areas along the coast of California. Now, our birds go all the way down to South America in order to spend the winter. The blue area that runs down through the Andes, that's where our birds go to spend the winter. Now, the the uh, olive back ones go down into Central America and they spend the, spend the winter there. And again, I just wanted to mention eBird data. You enter eBird data, this is what we can now do with eBird data, or this is what the scientists at Cornell can now do. Now let's look at the migration. So this is the Swainson's thrush migration. Our birds spend the winter down in South America, and then they come north to visit us up here and breed up here. In another six weeks, they should be singing. But get a load of that migration. Isn't that pretty amazing? Just watch that collective number of birds move north and move south. There's a Swainson's thrush chipping in the background. In April, they're at Panama. They're at Mount Tatumas. Might well be the most abundant bird in Mount Tatumas when I was there in April. All right, let's think about that Swainson's thrush for just a minute. So Swainson's thrush weighs one ounce. One ounce. And it winters in Colombia and Ecuador. It breeds up here in western Washington. Let's say one breeds in Snohomish County. How long does it take to get from South America up here? So a Swainson's thrush, all songbirds, they're going to build up a fat reserve. Then in the evening they get up and fly. And they fly until that fat reserve runs out. Maybe it's four or five, maybe it's six hours. You know, They fly for as long as they can until they burn up their fat. Then they got to come back down, refuel for a couple days and do it again. So they don't fly every night. You know, They've got to have a couple days to refuel. Well, how far can a Swainson's thrush fly? Maybe 200 miles, maybe 300 miles. If it's got a tailwind, maybe it can make 400 miles. You know, something in that order. I just wanted to do a thought process here. And I just said, 
What if a Swedish thrush can average 250 miles? How long would it take for a Swedish thrush that spent the winter on the border of Ecuador and Peru to come up here to western Washington? It would take 20 nights of flying. Not 20 nights in a row, because it's got to have time to build back up that fat reserve. But it would take 20 nights in order to do that. And so then I just plotted out dots approximately 250 miles apart. Is that the exact way the bird would fly? No. You know, maybe they'll fly a little more over to the Rocky Mountains. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. But this is, the, this is what this bird does, is it flies twice a year from South America up to visit us and breed up here, and it heads back down to South America. Now, sound birds fly by themselves. They don't fly in a flock. Each individual has to get up on its own, decides to fly, does it at night in order to avoid predation. Also, because it's a little cooler at night, and you think this bird is flying hard, it's like running as fast as you can, and it's going to do it for four or five or six hours. Flying at night when it's cooler is going to make a lot of sense. Now, they weigh one ounce and they fly on a 12-inch wingspan. So what does that look like? So one ounce is two tablespoons of dried wild rice. That's a third to a quarter of a serving of wild rice. It's 48 gabonzo beans, dry organic, of course, 48 gabonzo beans. And they fly on a 12-inch wingspan. They fly 5,000 miles twice a year. Let's look at that again. Here they're coming up north, going through Panama right now. Now they're going to be up here in the summer, finish breeding, head back south. Yeah, they're going to do it again. Now, there are four species of Catharis thrushes at Mount Tatumas. There's the Swainson's thrush, and then there's these other threes, the orange-billed nightingale thrush, the black-billed nightingale thrush, and the ruddy cap. The other three are all resident birds there. They're not migrants. Now, if you look at this genus, there's about 12 species. It looks like the Swainson's thrush was the first one to take up migration and start to migrate. And it did it before any of the other ones, so it was the first one to take up. But then a second group of them started to migrate, and you know we get the the uh, veery, the bicknell's thrush, the gray cheek thrush, and the hermit thrush all came as a separate group coming north. And the hermit thrush has stayed north now; it doesn't go all the way back down the way the others do. Uh, but they are not at Mount Tatumas, so we want to look for these birds now. Swainson's thrushes are everywhere in April when we're down there. Um, but the other three divide up the mountain by altitude. And what I've done here is the, I've done a line coming up through by the lodge and then up onto the top of Mount Tatumas. That's that line in green on the right. And then I've drawn that, the elevational going up there in that light blue line at the bottom. And I've put in the approximate distribution for each of the three species. So orange billed is the low elevation species, ruddy cap is the mid elevation, and black billed is the upper elevation. Don't hold me to these exact locations on there, because as you can see, I cannot draw a circle no matter what. Um, but that gives you some approximate ideas of where they are. Now, we're going to go first and look for the black billed nightingale thrush. The black build is the one that's up at higher elevation, so we're going to head up into the valley, up toward the Continental Divide, and see if we can find it. On another day, we'll head down into the valley and go down looking for the orange build, but let's go looking first for the, the black build. Now, calling in the background is the ruddy cap nightingale thrush. Um, but one of the things that's really incredible is to, that I think is very incredible when I've traveled is to hire a local guide and go with a local guide. It is one of the most rewarding things that I've ever done. 
And in this case, I'm hiking with Ronaldo. Ronaldo is absolutely amazing guy to be out with. You know, my dad used to have this saying that I never quite understood the saying, but if he had a higher respect for somebody, he would say, oh, that guy can look through muddy water and see dry land on the other side. And I'd just stare at him, wonder what the heck he could talk about, what he was talking about. But Ronaldo can look through a dense forest of tropical forest and you see birds sitting on the other side of that vegetation. Then he can find a little hole and put a spotting scope on it. I can't even find the bird in my binoculars, but he can find it. Then the bird gets up and moves six feet to the left. He'll find it right away again. He's just incredible to be out with. Now at 16, he approached the lodge owner and asked him if he could take customers birding. Well, he didn't know English. That didn't stop him. He took customers birding and he got them to teach him English and his English is really good. So it's really great to, to have that chance and do that. Um, and I've been fortunate now to hike with him three, three, oh, three different years that I've been down there. He's just amazing to be with. Now we're going to follow this green line all the way up into La Amistad International Park, both the green and the red line here. That's where we're going to head to get up into the higher elevations and see if we can find a black-billed nightingale thrush. I want to bring back in geology and just keep you thinking about geology. So we're going to do that red line. That's the very one goes farthest to the right. Now look at that semicircle of mountains that goes around it. We've actually, for this whole time, we've been in a caldera. We've been inside an extinct volcano the whole time we've been talking about birds in Panama. And that's the edge of that caldera there. So we're headed up into that caldera. The Lyamestead International Park. Now we are a little ways up and Ronaldo stopped and walked over to a wildlife camera that they had running on the side of the trail. Pulled the card out of the wildlife camera, put it in his camera. And there was a puma. It had walked by just two hours before we were there. He put the card back in. As he was doing that, he said nonchalantly, Puma, Jaguar likes the other side of the mountain. Then we started on up the trail. Meanwhile, I'm just trying to keep up. And we found a footprint of the Puma, another footprint of it, and then a scratch mark where it had marked the, the trail. And I'm thinking, I'm the slowest one here. I'm the Puma bait. We found monkeys. These are howler monkeys. But we are looking for birds. Again, resplendent quetzal. An old cavity that they nested in the year before I took this picture. Again, the fruit that they're really key on. This is often called quetzal fruit. We saw other stuff too, butterflies. The flame-throated warbler, one of the warblers. A rufous browed pepper shrike. This is a high elevation species, they call it red start. Ruddy tree runner. Now this is one of that subossing groups, that other group of birds that had major radiation in Latin America. Again, the collared red start, really pretty bird. Here's one of the wood creepers. I'm not sure which one this is. Um, and again, this is in that subossing group, a tufted flycatcher. It looks in silhouette, much like our fly, flycatchers. It is in a different genus than anything up here. But a very cute bird that likes the edges of openings in forests. Here's that opening kind of area. Collar trogon. But the forest is just spectacular. Thick, lush. Sometimes you find little treats along the way. Here's a little fixer-up cabin if you need a place. Here's Ronaldo at the ripe old age of 19. Two years later, I took some friends down there last April, and here, Ronaldo at 21. And you're always under being watched by something, lizards in particular. Fortunately, we didn't do anything wrong, and the lizards didn't attack. Spangled cheek tanager. The tree ferns were amazing, just lush and pretty. 
common chlorospingus. Now these are found at all elevation. Used to be known as a bush tanager. This is again a high altitude species, the collared red start. Cute little bird. Lots of flowers too. This is one of the paradise flowers. We found a lot of orchids in bloom. We also found this car. In case you're looking for a new car, I know where to take you to this one. Might be need a little fixing up. Lots of mosses, and the mosses look surprising like ones here. This is a lung moss, or at least lung lichen on the right, and the necker of the moss on the left. Very similar to the ones we have here. Lots of bromeliads and club mosses. Now we wanted to go down and cross the Rio Colorado so we could come up into this pasture area that was dominated by Costa Rican oaks. Now Costa Rican oaks are just incredible because they have the perfect bark system for supporting epiphytes for those plants that grow on another plant. And epiphytes include the lichens and orchids and mosses and bromeliads. And these are just covered with them and just spectacular to see. Golden, golden olive woodpecker. This is in the same genus as our flickers. And it's fascinating to look down on the top of the canopy and see how diverse it is. Now, this is a tropical rainforest, but it's a highly dynamic rainforest with a lot of changeover in trees. More than 600 species of trees to the acre. I mean, it is just really diverse here. Now, I just wanted to remind you, we're right there um, at standing right by the uh, end of that red dot or right in the center of this caldera. Now, if you know um, Crater Lake, as I understand Crater Lake, so Mount Mazama was the volcano there and it exploded in a massive volcano, one of the ma most massive explosions here in the Pacific Northwest in recent times. And then it crashed back down into the caldera, but yet it was still somewhat active so it put back up a cone in the middle, and that cone is the island that's within the lake there. And we're going to go up on top of Mount Tutumas, which is the line kind of headed straight north, which is a cinder cone inside this caldera. But first, we want to look at the edge. So that, that rim that you see going around there, that's the rim of the caldera, and we're down on the inside of it. A spot-crowned woodcreeper. Again, this is a bird in that uh, sub group. Sometimes the best way to get across water is... Go as fast as you can. All right, we did not find the black-billed nightingale thrush, so we missed out on that. So we'll head back down to the lodge. We stopped by this little place that looks out over, over this set of trees every time, and every time there's that three-waddle bellbird sitting there squawking away. This is rainy season, so the rain drops off the leaves. All right, we're headed up to Cerro Tuma. That's Mount Tutumas. So it's a cinder cone inside this caldera. We're going to go straight up that hill there on that blue line there and see what we found. Now I left the next morning really early in the morning and we're partway up the trail, Ronaldo and I, and he asked for my flashlight and puts it on this. This is a common putu. Now it was the first record of a putu for the reserve there, for Mount Tatumas Reserve. We're looking off from the side of the cinder cone. We found black cheek warblers. Again, a high elevation species, Quetzals. But we're headed up to see this old growth Costa Rican forest with an understory of bamboo and tons and tons of epiphytes. And it was a day that I wished we didn't have sun. I wished it was cloudy so I could have a better chance of photographing those epiphytes because they were just spectacular. Now bamboo is interesting. It has a lifespan of 19 or 20 years then the whole population flowers at once and dies. And the bamboo up here in this forest had flowered the year before I was there, and it had all died. So it was in a transition with a new set of bamboo coming up. But lots of tree ferns to see. Just really a lot of spectacular stuff there. Just look at that lush. I mean, that must be tons of epiphytes growing on each one of those branches. Just amazing things to see. Again, the collar red start. There's our black-billed nightingale thrush. Again, one of that in that genus Catharis, same genus that our Swainson's thrushes are in. Again, the, the black-billed nightingale thrush. 
Sooty cap Chlorospingus, again a high elevation species. Lush understory. Now this, see all the, the dead uh, bamboo there? Now the large, this is a large footed finch. It's confined to the highlands of Costa Rica and Western Panama. Just a fantastic bird. And look at the size of its legs and feet. Just amazing there. Now this thing moves leaves underneath the, the understory. Any towy chickadee, I'm not to chickadee, any towy song sparrow, um, junco would be totally envious of having legs like this in order to look for seeds in the understory. Tree ferns. We found some interesting fungus too. Again, the quetzals. That's where we're headed back. Oh, emerald toucanet. In the emerald toucanet. Oh, there's that three wild bellbird screeching. Just, I mean, they're they're ten times louder than they ought to be, and it's always kind of makes you jump out of your skin. Spider monkeys. Now look at how long their legs and arms are on this. This is spider monkeys. Now this is a new world monkey, so they have a prehensile tail. So keep your eye out there. You might see it hanging. There's one hanging from the tail. Also watch for a baby on one of these. Now we saw three species of monkeys there. The spider monkey, the capuchin monkey, and the howler monkeys. There's the three waddle bell bird again. Okay, now it's time for us to go down into the valley and look for the orange-billed nightingale thrush. One never knows what the weather might be. But that's okay. That's what makes it fun. So we're going to follow the orange line down into the lower elevation and see what we can find. So we had go down through this ravine with the water rushing down through it. Now there's going to be a waterfall in the next slide, I think. And the first year I was down there, there was a hermit, which is a kind of, of hummingbird nesting up behind that waterfall. Just really neat. Oh, there's our orange-billed nightingale thrush. The low elevation catharis. Now I didn't go to have a chance to talk about coffee, but shade grown coffee is really important. And I hope if you drink coffee, you make sure you buy shade grown. Organic's not that important, but shade grown is. It's a critical place for lots of resident birds, lots of neotropical migrants. This is a female scarlet runt tanager. We also saw Cotamundis, a mammal. Sometimes you slip. So Ronaldo yelled, call her Trogon, and it was right over my head. And as I leaned to try to take the picture, I slipped. Spider monkeys again. And you got to get your picture of a bull when you can. Here's a rose-breasted grosbeak. Now this is one of those... Neotropical migrants, it's going to head to northeastern United States to breed. But wintering areas in Central America are really important for it. Again, coffee plantations are very important for the survival of that bird. And it needs to be shade-grown coffee. The mosses, again, were just fantastic. The lichens, and I think this is a kind of... Oh, here's the best bird of the trip! A chicken! It was so exciting to see this. I had to get down on my knees, right at level with the chicken, and take a picture of it. Well, you know, when you're a son of a chicken farmer... Chickens are an important part. They bring back a lot of good memory. So I really had to get this pictures really well on that. My friends didn't stop laughing for 10 minutes after I was taking pictures. Not one of them got down and took a picture of that chicken. Couldn't believe it. A male scarlet rump tanager. They've also known as cherry tanager. This has been split and lumped and split and lumped several times. A striped-tailed hummingbird. Again, a striped-tailed hummingbird. Yellowish flycatcher. Now you might say, wow, that's a really similar body shape to flycatchers we have here, like the Pacific Slope, the Dusky, the Hammonds. And yes, it is. It's in the same genus. And it's just as hard to tell apart there 
as as ours are up here. Just a good looking little bird though. Spot crown wood creeper. Again, it's one of those subossines. Again, that's the wood creeper. They look very much like our our brown creepers in terms of running up the sides of the trees looking for things in there. Fills that similar niche. Now let's continue kind of in our thinking about things. So you get back from doing all of this and you, know, you sit down and you start to write some notes and you're thinking about what you've seen and you go, I got to get a beer. They got a great place there. It's all, all you know, self-serve and you write down how many beers you drink and put it in a little thing and pay for it at the end. So it's really nice to do that. So you, you get this and you uh, walk outside and lo and behold, there's one of your old friends. It's flitting around, looking at you. Doesn't look like it's really feeding very hard. It's almost like it's trying to tell you something. Good old friend of yours. Now this is a member of the wood warbler family. That's a family of birds that's in the new world, has a major radiation in Latin America, major radiation all through North America. Here's the four species of wood warblers that are resident there that we've seen. So the uh, black cheek warbler on the upper left, the collared red star on the upper right, the slate throated red star on the bottom left, and <clears throat> the flame throated warbler on the bottom right. But the family has a lot of species. It has 119 species in 18 genera. And when I think of warblers, I think of sophomore year in high school. And oh my God, that always sends the shivers to me, sophomore year in high school. But in the sophomore year in high school, I discovered there are other people besides my family that like birds. And I had people to go birding with. And in May of that year, a bunch of us left from in the Pittsburgh area really early in the morning to drive north to Lake Erie to go to a place called Prescow, which was a peninsula sticking out into Lake Erie. We happened to time it for the third weekend in May, which happened to be peak of spring migration. And you would not believe how many birds were congregated on this peninsula, feeding the last bit before they tried to fly across Lake Erie to go up to Canada. There were sparrows, there were flycatchers, there were tanagers, there were everything, and there were a lot of warblers. And we saw close to two dozen warblers that day. More warblers than I even knew existed before that trip. It was just amazing. Now, many of these were headed up to the boreal forest to breed. Not all of them, but many of them. And so I want to come back um, and start to thinking about warblers, the boreal forest, Washington, and the Isthmus of Panama, and tie that all together. And we'll do that by looking at one complex of warblers, the black-throated green warbler complex. So this is the set of four birds that are fairly closely related, the black-throated green warbler complex. So black-throated green warblers in the upper left, Townsend's warbler on the right, upper right, hermit warbler on the lower right, and black-throated gray on the lower left. So these four birds are fairly closely related to, to each other. And when I led a field trip at the Hood River Canal, you know, one of the things I was told is we're going into hermit warbler area, make sure you find hermit warblers for people because it may be on their wish list. And I was lucky, I had two really great birders who were really good birding by year, and we actually found both Townsend's and Hermit's, and we found some hybrids that had a mixture of plumage between there and messed up songs. So that was really pretty cool. But these four birds are closely related. Here's the distributions for them. Again, this is using eBird data. So the black-throated green warblers up into that Canada to breed comes down into Latin America, and I've seen it at Mount Tatumas. The black-throated gray is kind of the lower southwest species. It does get all the way up here through Washington. The Townsend's is the very northwest species, breeding-wise. And then the hermit is kind of south of the Townsend's, and they do overlap. But what does this all have to do with the Isthmus of Panama? That's probably what you're asking. I hope that's what you're asking. And that's what we want to explore next. So, you know, back in high school... I remember learning about the fact that the Isthmus of Panama was formed. We got down a land bridge 
and the mammals and land animals from South America came up into North America. And that's what's shown by the green animals up over North America. Those are things of South American origin that came north. Then we also had things of North American origin that went south, and that's the stuff in blue down in South America. So we talked a lot about that. I don't remember us ever talking about the oceans. So let's think about that. Before that land bridge formed, there was a connection between the Atlantic and the Pacific. And that's shown nicely in this stylized picture. Now the Pacific was warmer, or is warmer than the Atlantic, and there was a net movement of water across this isthmus and into the Atlantic, so the Pacific kept the Atlantic warmer. And now at the Isthmus of Panama, and I tried to double check these facts, so I may not have them quite right, but what I remember is the Pacific side is higher than the Caribbean side when you go across the uh, Panama Canal. Uh, and of course, you know, you're going up and over and down on the Panama Canal, but those sides are different. It has to do with winds and currents and stuff. So the net movement of water was out of the Pacific and into the Atlantic, and probably when there was lots of water moving through there, the Gulf Stream was a very weak stream, was probably not like it is now. And the Gulf Stream now is strong. It actually keeps Europe about 10 degrees warmer than it would be through the winter if the Gulf Stream wasn't there. So it's a very significant thing. But we've got this kind of net movement keeping the Atlantic warm. Well, the Isthmus started to form about 15 million years ago, closed up about two and a half million years ago. And with that, it cut off that flow of warm water out of the Pacific and into the Atlantic. The Atlantic started to cool. It had a disruption of the current pattern, and it was the trigger for the last glaciation. Now, the Pleistocene glaciations, there were four sets of ice sheets that came down out of the north in order to cover North America. So four times that ice came down and then receded back up. And as the ice came down, sea levels dropped way down. When the ice receded all the way up and even receded, so there's less ice in the world than there is right now, and water levels were higher. If you've ever gone to Florida and gone to Archbold Biological Station in central Florida to look for Florida scrub jays, you're actually walking on a sand dune that was formed during one of those interglacial periods when the oceans was pounding at the sides and built that giant sand dune in the middle of Florida. So we have this movement of ice back and forth. And as it comes down, it separates vegetation communities. They get pushed farther south with the cold um, and, and communities get isolated. In the tropics, we've got similar things going on, not the ice, but we have a cooling temperatures, a change in the rain, rain patterns. So the high ele elevation vegetation in the mountains gets pushed lower. That lower lush jungles gets isolated into fragments. We get isolation of species. It's probably a big driver of that set of catharsis, those nightingale thrushes that we looked at. This may be when they started to evolve. It may also have been that recession and pushing was the pressure that started that Swainson's thrush to fly north and the other thrushes to fly north. So, you know, it's a dynamics. But what about the warblers? He keeps coming back to the warblers. Well, let's look at that a little bit. So let's look at this black-throated green complex a little bit more. So back in 1975, this guy put out an, an article in Living Bird, um, the journal that Cornell Lab puts out, and this was a scientific paper, and he was looking at a whole set of birds, and he was thinking about uh, glaciation, and he said, you know what, maybe this was the driver that isolated a parental species, and then during the glaciation they evolved into two species, when they came back together, they didn't interbreed, and we had separate species. And his idea, he looked at several, but one of the groups he looked at was this black-throated green. Now, I want to emphasize that two and a half million years ago, there was not the black-throated green warbler we see today. It was an ancestor of it, a pre-black-throated green. So his idea was back then there was this pre-black-throated green that nested in the boreal forest. The glacier comes down, continental glacier, divides it. And while the glacier's there, we get somehow the division of this population and they evolve separately. When it comes back up, we've got the ancestor of the black-throated gray and we've got the ancestor of the black-throated green. Not the exact species we have today, but the ancestors because evolution is still happening. 
Then we get another wave, you know, a few hundred thousand years later, another wave of ice comes down. And a second time, that black-throated green complex gets divided again, and we have speciation going on. Then maybe we get the Townsend's ancestor, or maybe we get the Hermit's ancestor, I don't know which, um, but we get that separation. Then we get another receding of the glaciers, and the next time it happens, maybe it divides that Townsend Hermit ancestor into the two populations, or maybe we cut off another one from the black throated green. I mean, it's clear Townsend's and Hermit's interbreed, so they're not totally separate, but um, you would get that speciation. So that's the driver there. This glaciation helped divide and allow speciation to take place. Now along comes genetic analysis that we have now where people look at genes and use that to look at relationships. And one of the things they've looked at is they look at mitochondrial DNA. So a mitochondria is this little tiny body within your cell. You have a whole bunch of mitochondria. It's the main thing that generates the, the chemical that your cell uses for energy. So it's the one that does that final breaking down of the sugar to really generate your power within there. You get all your mitochondria from your maternal side. So do birds get it all from their maternal side. And it's thought that all mitochondrial DNA has the same rate of mutation across all animals. So if you look at how much the mitochondrial DNA has been different between two groups, you can tell how old it was. So we got this theory about glaciation. A whole bunch of people looked at a lot of species and they said, oh, there's a lot of examples of this where this glaciation caused the division of species. Uh, another warbler group is the morning warbler and the McGill overreach warbler. Um, the, northern, nor, uh, the, the, <laughs> the northern oriole, which is now divided into the Bullock's Oriole and the Baltimore Oriole, you know, that might be another group. The flickers haven't totally divided. Maybe that's another group. The um, juncos is another group. So there's a whole bunch of groups. And there's actually somewhere in the mid-30s that people were saying in the 70s and 80s and 90s, maybe these were all about this glaciation dividing it. So along comes the 2000s. We got this fancy genetic analysis. And somebody uses this. Uh, the DNA from mitochondria DNA and looks at it and what they find is some of those groups are looks like their division was much older than two and a half million years. So this theory is no good. And that's the way the popular literature reported it. If you Google this glaciation and bird speciation, you can find some really nice articles written up that basically throw the baby out with the bathwater. They say, all right, this theory is not true. It doesn't work. Well, then two or three years later, another professor says, well, wait a minute. The original idea was about boreal species. Let's just look at those. And so that set of professors just looked at a smaller set of birds, including this black throated green warbler complex. And they came up with, yeah, this separation has taken place over the last two or two and a half million years. So we may have a connection here. The formation of the Isthmus of Panama and the speciation of this black-throated green complex. Okay, we've covered a lot of stuff tonight. We've covered a lot of ground, a lot of fascinating things. 60 million years of history, perching birds, sub glaciation, geology, just all kinds of things that I think are really neat. A lot of stuff we haven't been able to talk about, don't have enough time. Hummingbirds and pollination, and I know next month's talk will be on hummingbirds, so we at WASP will get a lot of that. Tanagers and coevolution. When I went to southern Mexico the first time in 1972, all the tanagers were in one family. Now they're in four separate families, and some of those families aren't that closely related. They've gotten the word tanager out of some birds' names because they're so different. So just a lot. We could talk a lot more about the southern continents and why we have the birds we have. And again, every day that I see a chickadee come into my bird feeder or a group of bush tits, I thank Australia because songbirds made it through that Cretaceous extinction in Australia and evolved there and then spread around the world. Parrots, falcons, and passerines are more closely related. Falcons are more closely related to those two groups than they are to hawks. I mean, just some fascinating stuff. Well, you know, I was trying to find a 
a bird and a photograph that might really summarize what I've been trying to go over for you tonight. And I think this photograph and this bird does it pretty well. This is again the long-footed finch, a bird found in the high elevation forests of Costa Rica and Panama. This photograph may well be the best photograph taken last year when I was down there with my camera, but I didn't take it. We had just climbed 2,300 feet up the cinder cone to reach this forest and I was hurting. And Ronaldo, my guide, was happy to carry my camera at the time. Oh, to be 21. And he took this picture. Now, I do my homework before I go on a trip. I try to read everything I can about birds. I try to look up stuff on the natural history. I often read memoirs if I can find them from the area, just to get a feel for that. I didn't even know this bird existed before I went on this trip. I learned about it the night before when we were talking about what might be the birds we'd see at this high elevation. So, you know, when I think about birds and think about what all they give to me, I have a great deal of humility. I mean, they just bring it out in me. Uh, birds are who I turn to at times of despair and anguish. They've been important in these last few weeks if we've been, as I've been isolated just to watch the ones coming to my bird feeder and they were what helped me climb out of a pretty big pit after my wife died and I lost my job. So I have a lot of humility. I have a lot of reverence for them. They are magnificent creatures. Their habitats, their lives. To think a Swainson's thrush can fly 5,000 miles and I jump for joy every chance I get to see a bird, ponder the challenges they face, their existence, you know, I still watch this ball of bush tits that come into my feeder. I have a, a, a suet feeder that then has a wire mesh to keep the squirrels around it. And this ball will form, and it's like this magnum mess of moving protoplasm there. It's just so amazing, and I can stand and watch that the whole time they're there. I hope for you, I hope I've spurred your sense of wonder. There's some pretty amazing things among the bird world and pretty cool to, to see and think about. You know, for me, when I stand in a wild place, even including my window, you know, I just feel insignificant in, in the essence of this world and nature and what all that goes on. And I hope you've come away with a much greater sense of awe for our feathered friends. I mean, to think that a 48 dried garbanzo beans, this ball of 48 dried garbanzo beans can fly 5,000 miles from South America to Washington then sing that magnificent song for us then turn around and fly back down. Or, you know, that that, that, that uh, Townsend's warbler that comes to your suet fever right now, that it is a result of the formation or, or help was as a result of the formation of the Isthmus of Panama. I mean, I just hope this all brings a new perspective for you. Now, I've been teaching birding for the last couple of years for both East Side Audubon and the Mountaineers, and often someone will ask me about a faraway bird, and I'll see the silhouette, and I know right away it's an American robin. And I usually tell them that, and then they go, oh, I'm sorry. They're embarrassed that they had asked about it. But what I do is I try to set the spotting scope up and I try to get everybody in my group to look at that American robin, just to look at its shape, to look at its silhouette and get a sense for it. And remember, that robin's in the genus Turtis. There's 84 species in that genus. They are successful all over the world, everywhere except Australia. They've been introduced there. The European blackbird's been introduced there, which is a Turtis, and they're now there. But you know, natively, they're across all the rest of the world. I mean, it's just amazing to think. But most importantly, I hope you get increased joy when you go out birding. Thank you very much. Uh, Elaine tells me that there is a way for you to ask questions, and either she can read them to me or we can figure out how to do that, and I'd be happy to try to answer them. Thank you all very much. I've enjoyed this tremendously.